The collective voice of the Muslim world. That's what the Organization of Islamic Cooperation prides itself on. But as its leaders gather in Turkey, can they come up with unified solutions to some of the challenges facing the Muslim world today? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. As more than 30 leaders from Islamic countries gather in the Turkish city of Istanbul, the main message has been one of unity. But it's hard to disguise the fact the Muslim world is deeply divided. The leaders of two of the biggest countries in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and Iran, are locked on opposing sides of conflicts in Syria and Yemen. ISIL and its ideology threatens to destabilize or consume nations around the world. And hundreds of thousands of refugees from the Muslim world are being forced to uproot their lives and relocate to an increasingly unwelcoming Europe. It's against this backdrop that the Organization of Islamic Cooperation Summit is being held. Lots for us to discuss today, so let's bring in our guests straight away in Istanbul, Ahmed Han. Associate Professor of International Relations at Kadir Has University. In London, Azam Tamimi, academic and political activist. And in New York, Nicholas Pelham, the economist, Middle East correspondent and author of the new book, Holy Lands, Reviving Pluralism in the Middle East. A very warm welcome to all three of you. Let me come to you first, Ahmed Han. It's a group that's meeting today as we speak, important leaders there, important time. But every time the OIC and its members get together, very little happens. So I'm wondering, what's the point? Well, uh, I think this time too will not be a, a positive disillusionment, if I may say so, and not much will come out of uh, this meeting too. Uh, the thing is OIC has uh, very little internal cohesion when it comes to critical problems uh, of the region because most of the OIC members are uh, regional powers and uh, they have their own and diverse interests and uh, with uh, such precondition uh, they are not able to agree on uh, everything uh, and uh, they are not able to uh, implement uh, many uh, when it comes to the issues on, to, on the ground. Uh, that is part of the problem, I believe. Nicholas Pelham, your thoughts about this meeting? Could something come out of it, or is it just a waste of time? There, there are so few fora today um, in the Middle East where uh, Sunni and Shia leaders uh, get together, meet together, uh, rub shoulders, and at the very least, this is one opportunity to show that there is such a thing as a Muslim world which includes uh, Sunnis and Shias. Um, so to that extent, the message that it's sending uh, is a sign of a potential for unity. It's up to the leaders themselves as to whether they can uh, deliver that. And they do, despite the diversity, they do all have uh, uh, common problems. They've got, they're all having to deal with sagging oil prices. Uh, they're all having to do with burgeoning um, populations, massive youth unemployment. They know that uh, if they don't address these issues, they're going to be faced with another round of um, something akin to the to the Arab Spring and they're going to have to find a way forward in which uh, economies are not solely dependent on oil um, they're going to need to rely more on trade and that means opening up borders and uh, beginning to uh, do what the region used to do in the past to thrive and that was uh, have um, cr cr cross-border traffic cross-border movement um, and a, a much greater degree of pluralism than currently exists in the region. Azam Tamimi, considering its track record, do you think we are likely to see any of those changes, those suggestions put forward by Nicholas? Well, very unlikely. Um, this organization, like other organizations uh, within the Muslim world, happen to be clubs of ruling elites, and this is the fundamental problem with them. I mean, if you were to compare them, for instance, with the European Union, uh, the uh, member countries of the OIC, just like the member countries of the Arab League uh, or the uh, uh, Arab uh, Maghreb Union, 
do not represent the interests of the people they rule. Um, uh, and and uh, the, uh, the, the difference between these uh, various uh, ruling elites simply uh, do not enable them to agree on, uh, on much. And uh, this uh, particular summit uh, could not have come at a worse time. Uh, and uh, during better times, it didn't do uh, much anyway. Let's just remind ourselves of what the Organization of Islamic Cooperation really is and why it was started. It's an international group that has 57 member states representing one and a half billion Muslims around the world. It was founded in 1969. The OIC has many goals, including strengthening economic and trade ties between Muslim countries and protecting what it calls the true image of Islam. This year, one of the main topics on the agenda is the Israel-Palestine conflict. Remember that conflict, Ahmed Han? I mean, that really seems to have slipped off the radar, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, but I think the Israeli-Palestinian issue, uh, despite the fact that it is pretty much uh, the pretext of uh, many of the foreign policy moves that the nation states that are members of the OIC uh, are taking, is uh, back in the drawer. Uh, that definitely does not, that issue that definitely does not constitute a, 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 a the primary topic uh, or a, a critical agenda item for the OIC in the face of what is happening internally and uh, regionally uh, in the Middle East right now. Uh, considering that much of these nations who are members of the OIC are uh, members of the uh, Middle Eastern regional community and they are faced with uh, the, the same kind of overlapping challenges of uh, supra and sub-national identities, conflicting interests and diverse uh, points of view, uh, this uh, agenda item of uh, Israel-Palestine is not to be expected to take precedence over uh, items which are much more important on the political agenda right now, because uh, exactly because these, these uh, diverse issues, these other issues are very much influential on the uh, survival of uh, some of the regimes here, which are suffering state society mismatch. As um, the Israel-Palestine conflict was key to so much of what was going on until relatively recently, do you think the problems that we're seeing now have moved into the, the bigger arena of, and if I can put it simply, Iran and Saudi Arabia? Is that the driving force behind so much of what's going on at the moment? Yes, indeed, and I agree with Ahmed. I think the Palestinian issue has uh, taken uh, a back seat, uh, right, quite distant, actually. And uh, not only that, not only because of the repercussions of uh, the so-called uh, Arab Spring and the disputes and the divisions that resulted uh, from it, but also because uh, on Palestine, uh, there is a clear division among the members. I mean, uh, half of the Arab countries today don't see Israel as an enemy, and uh, some of them either overtly or covertly uh, deal with Israel uh, uh, as a friend. Look at Egypt. Egypt is laying siege uh, to Gaza just as Israel is laying siege uh, to Gaza. Uh, so how can you get uh, these members uh, to agree? Probably Turkey uh, has uh, a clear uh, position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Israel, although it had always uh, had diplomatic relations with Israel, but uh, uh, some of the other members of the OIC uh, are actually going to bed with Israel every night. So it's a shifting allegiances, Nicholas, that make, I, I suppose, it's so hard to come to some kind of solution to the many problems that the Middle East is seeing. The fact that now many more countries are, are dealing with Israel, the fact that Iran has effectively come in from the cold. Uh, yes, absolutely. And as, as I was saying, it's a perhaps a sign of the superfi superficiality of the uh, discussions at the OIC that they are trying to focus on the one issue that they hope might be a source of um, um, unity and they're not really addressing uh, the uh, m many conflicts which are which are uh, other conflicts which are raging um, a across uh, the region uh, that said I think there have been some uh, uh, positive steps in in recent weeks to try and uh, address some of the um, uh, uh, conflicts in, 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 Ye in Yemen. There have been negotiations uh, on Yemen, negotiations on Syria. They're not going very well at the moment. There is an upsurge of violence 
Um, I think the problem that all the, uh, uh, that the main sort of powerhouses of the region, as you were saying, Iran and Saudi Arabia face is that uh, until now they've been trying to project their um, uh, regional uh, power uh, through military force, through arming of militias, uh, through uh, increased weaponization across uh, the region. And uh, they are looking to their own constituencies, their own um, uh, sex to, 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 to mobilize um, forces on the ground, and that is leading to uh, intensified uh, conflict. Um, I think the region will own, violence in the region will only begin to subside when um, Iran and Saudi Arabia look to project their influence through, um, through trade, through, uh, through, uh, through, through uh, economic power rather than through military power. Because, Ahmed, this really is the open wound at the heart of the Middle East, isn't it? Yeah, of course, this is a, a very, very important wound at the heart of the Middle East. But uh, nevertheless, it uh, unfortunately is not the only wound uh, in, uh, in the heart of the Middle East. And uh, under such circumstances, uh, I believe that it, it is expected and natural that uh, national interests with uh, all the cold blood that such an argument is served uh, takes precedence over, uh, over others. Uh, if we look at it in the context of your previous question, what do we see now? Uh, Egypt is even harsher on, uh, on, on Hamas than Israel itself, at least is, uh, as matching as Israel is. Uh, and uh, what, with what is happening between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, Syria becomes another contested area in intra-Arab, intra-Muslim politics and uh, is, is becoming a graver issue with each passing day, uh, devoid of uh, the, the, the turns that the civil uh, war that is taking place in Syria is taking. Even if there is a, a peace table of some sort uh, right now, uh, f more or less functioning, uh, we are not attaining any results uh, in Syria. And uh, with all those different layers of problems existing with uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, with what is happening in Syria and diverse positions of the uh, Muslim states vis-a-vis uh, -vis what is happening in Syria, uh, diverse positions of, again, the um, uh, Islamic states uh, against what is happening with uh, uh, Palestine and Israel. Uh, it is very hard to see an alignment which is sustainable and which is going to be uh, consequential on uh, the solution of any of those uh, issues that the Middle East is facing uh, right now. Uh, I mean, uh, Azam, do, do you think, uh, uh, excuse be, me, jumping uh, in horizon. here, do you think the Saudis will be able to drag Turkey into the conflict even more so, considering the fact that they've got closer together? I think both countries uh, felt uh, they needed each other, especially after the death of King Abdullah uh, and uh, what seemed to be a slight uh, shift uh, in uh, Saudi uh, vision or Saudi uh, policy. Uh, but I'm not sure uh, they're likely to be, uh, uh, to be successful because eventually uh, Turkey uh, supported the Arab Spring and supported democratic transformation in the region uh, despite uh, the cost uh, to its own economy as a result of this, whereas Saudi Arabia uh, invested billions of dollars in order to abort the process of democratization. So I see them disagreeing on this fundamental issue, although uh, they, they've tried to cooperate uh, uh, on some other issues uh, as if uh, in, an, uh, in an endeavor to lessen the tension and also uh, to uh, uh, reshape the alliances in the region. But also going back to cooperation and the call that we saw time and time again when the leaders made their address at the OIC, it was all about unity. And I'm just wondering how you can bring about cooperation, how you can bring about unity, considering you've got these, these two big camps, these two big divides, and the people who were at the OIC meeting and those who weren't. I mean, we didn't see Egypt's Sisi at the meeting. What impact will that make? Well, uh, I don't expect any cooperation uh, to be successful unless there is some uh, common ground, and the common ground is, is, hasn't materialized uh, yet. I think the real issue today uh, in the Middle East is not the Palestinian issue. The real issue uh, is the future of 
the quest for change, uh, the, uh, the request for uh, doing away with autocracy, with corruption. Uh, and I think uh, there, there is, uh, it is unlikely that we will see agreement on this issue. All right, you say the need for change. We're looking at that picture now, the family photo of the OIC. And um, I mean, all but a very few of those leaders are dictators. Nicholas, how do you push through more uh, successful political or push through successful political reforms when you've got these long-standing dictatorships? Uh, the, the region is what it is at the moment. Clearly, the process of dem democratization is um, uh, a, a long-term need for the region. I think in the current sectarian climate, there's a real danger that democr democratization and elections simply mean empowering the, the majority, um, empowering one sect over another, uh, one tribe over another. And uh, in, in the short term, if, elec if all elections are, if all democracy is, is um, the empowering of one sect against another, that is just simply going to um, inflame the region. I think what is uh, as important is to accompany a process of uh, democratization with a, a process of pluralism. The region comes from, the good news in the region is that it has a very rich tradition of uh, uh, preserving and uh, uh, um, uh, its, its diversity of sects working uh, with, with each other. That's why there are so many sects in the region, indigenous sects in the region, in a way that they just simply don't exist um, in other parts of the world in, in Europe. Um, if the region can uh, recover some of the values of pluralism that it had in the past um, and accompany that with a process of democratization, then uh, uh, the, there is a brighter future, but uh, uh, and Nicholas, sadly, the democracy the aside, I mean, I mean if that were to happen, if that were to happen, it'll help the growing divisions that we're seeing because of sectar sectarianism. Uh, if, if, if if there is sufficient wisdom in the region, if they can recover some of those values that were so intrinsic to the region in the past, um, then then yes, absolutely. This current sectarian mayhem um, is really something of an of an aberration. Um, it's being whipped up by leaders who want to project their influence through, um, through, through, through their sex. If they realize that they're in, through arming militias, you know, there's a high danger that those militias are going to rebound against them um, and they're only harming themselves in the long run, then perhaps the region can see a brighter future. But at the moment, um, they, pretty much they seem stuck in a, in a very dark tunnel. Ahmed, other than unity, which was stressed, sectarian issues was also raised, it clearly is a big problem, a growing problem. Where do you see this heading? Well, uh, I think the answer uh, more than democratization lies in uh, the spirit of democratization, which is pluralism. Uh, as long as uh, pluralism as, as, as an overriding principle is not uh, adopted to the uh, systems of the Middle Eastern countries. And uh, as long as those countries uh, do not start to see uh, uh, creating a uh, sustainable regional economic and security environment as their priority rather than the regime seeing their staying power uh, in government or as, as monarchs and, uh, and dictators in their countries, uh, it is very hard for the Middle East to find uh, a solution to the uh, mayhem that it is suffering uh, right now. Uh, we are to, uh, to, to we are forced to think that uh, these issues, these very crucial issues of democratization, rule of law, pluralism, are as back in the drawer as the Palestine-Israel issue, uh, if not more, uh, in the agendas of. Uh, the OIC members by and large. And uh, I do not see any genuine effort uh, on the part of many countries uh, on bringing a, a solution to, to those very fundamental root causes of, of the sufferings of the Middle East. And as long as this uh, state society mismatch, as the IR theory puts, uh, is, is in place, it will be very hard for those countries to make uh, peace with, with, with each other internally uh, and externally. Uh, and that is going to, to, to lead to sustained forms of uh, conflicting uh, interests. And as a result, uh, 
outright conflict, if not uh, very much distance and uncooperative uh, okay. relations amongst those countries. Azam, surely good leadership to be the will help. Root cause of what, what is happening. Are we seeing good leadership anywhere? Well, uh, we are waiting for the next cycle of revolution. We had one cycle and then a counter-revolution. The only way uh, uh, forward uh, is for the people to rise again, and we've seen this before uh, in major revolutions that changed the, first, the, the face of history, in the French Revolution, in the revolutions of Latin America. So I think the way forward is another cycle of revolution. Do you agree with that, Nicholas? Are, are we seeing another revolution, or is there a leader anywhere who's, who's able to stop this? Uh, I think it's undoubtedly the case that the problems of the uh, region at the moment are only intensifying. Uh, all the major powers in the region are facing uh, massive budget deficits. Um, uh, they, the, the sagging uh, oil uh, prices and oil revenues can't begin to deliver um, the needs of the, of, of the uh, populations if they don't do some, if the leaders don't do something very soon um, to. Uh, reverse the trajectory on which they're on, then I think Azam is absolutely right. We're facing another cycle of, uh, of revolution. And that I hope that that is injecting a sense of urgency to uh, m such gatherings as the OIC. Um, it, it doesn't appear at, at the moment that, 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 that it is, but it, yeah. um, okay. 2011, uh, at, the very, at the very least, must have been a major wake up for the call for, 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 for many of the monarchies and many of the presidents and leaders of the region. Um, and and, 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 and Ahmed, excuse me, jumping in here. The, the more the revolutions, the more the fighting goes on, the, 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 the greater the dictatorships, the more flow of people to places like Europe where there's growing animosity towards Muslims entering their countries. No doubt about that. And I think that, um, well, treating revolution as a positive concept, I would say that before we see a renewed cycle of uh, revolution, what we're going to see is spreading out of violence more and more in uh, terms of uh, internal conflicts and perhaps uh, extraterritorial uh, wars in, in this region. And this is going to, of course, produce more and more immigrants. And m much of those immigrants, uh, as the experience shows, uh, want to, to, to find a new life, a renewed opportunity, if I may, in Europe. And that is a problem for uh, Europe and also for the, the, the region too, because uh, these people are uh, also amongst the best and brightest of the, the region who are able to create, bring and sustain change in this, uh, in this region. And that is also a, an important issue. Without even uh, these conflicts, these disturbances uh, uh, transforming into outright uh, civil strife and civil war, uh, uh, people are, uh, I mean, these best and, and brightest, as I call them, are seeking their fortune and their, their future in, uh, in countries that are outside of the region, mainly Europe and the United States. And that, I believe, is, is a core problem. Change and breakthroughs, the message to the OIC discussing this today. Thank you very much, Ahmed Han, Azam Tamimi, and Nicholas Pelham. Thank you. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again if you wish, wish anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story or at Jane Dutton. For me, the rest of the team, Goodbye.